Welcome to Train Signal. You are watching the components of Cisco UCS B series. So now it's time to really dive into the unified computing system from Cisco. We'll start by talking about how UCS is different. Uh, you may be comparing this to other Blade or server platforms, and we'll kind of go through and show you why UCS is different from those and how its architecture is also kind of differentiated from other systems you may have seen. Then, comparisons of traditional blade enclosures to UCS. So often we compare, you know, Dell or IBM or HP blade enclosures to UCS, and this will show you how they're different. Next, overview of the components that make up the UCS architecture. We'll go component by component, starting at the top and working our way down through the chassis into the blades, and show you all the pieces and parts so you understand what they do, how they work, and how they work together. Then, We'll describe the fabric interconnects and their options, describe the fabric extenders, and finally describe the UCS chassis itself. Go into a little bit more detail on each of those. Uh, those are kind of your major components, so you'll want to understand those very well. Next, we go through each of the different blade models. There are several different blades, shapes, sizes, things like that, just like there are servers, so I want to talk about those. And finally, comparing the different mezzanine adapter options and we'll go through those and how they fit on the blades and what your different options are and why you may choose one over another. So first, how is UCS different? So Cisco did not have a, you know, a previous server platform. So the UCS architecture is very different from other legacy blade systems. Cisco started this, it was a project known as Project California. There's actually a book out there that you can get that kind of talks about the development cycle and how UCS came to be. It, it's an interesting read to kind of go through some of this and how things came about. But Cisco kind of modeled this after their long life switch products. And I'll talk about that as we look at the chassis and kind of, you know, the life cycle of a UCS system. But Cisco has a lot of experience in that area. You know, they've been making catalyst switches forever, uh, very popular, very long lasting, not something that you replace every three years. So they took a lot of what they knew from top of rack switching, 10 gig ethernet, servers, chassis, put it together in Project California and came up with the UCS B series architecture. So traditional blade enclosures are usually pretty complex and, and often they're very expensive. And here on the left, I've kind of got kind of a logical diagram, you know, of a traditional blade enclosure. And this isn't any specific blade enclosure, you know, it's not an IBM, it's not a Dell, it's not an HP or anything like that. But it kind of shows you what's inside a normal blade enclosure. So we've got servers there in the middle, those are your blades. And then at the top, we've got, say, some fiber channel switches, one on each side for redundancy. And down at the bottom in blue, we have network switches. Again, usually two of them for redundancy. They may be 1 gig, they may be 10 gig. They may not even be true switches. They may just be kind of like pass-through modules. But they have to be managed. So when you take a look at a chassis, you've got, you know, normally two fiber channel switches if you use fiber channel, two network switches for data connectivity, and then usually, usually two management boards within a chassis for, again, redundancy. So if you look at it, that's a lot of infrastructure, right? That's a lot of IPs to manage. It's a lot of firmware to update. And really what they've done is, you know, and the reason I've not been a big fan of blade chassis is they've basically taken a rack's worth of infrastructure, you know, two top of rack fiber switches, two top of rack ethernet switches, added management, and collapsed it into a smaller form factor. If you want to do things like unified management, well, normally what happens is, is you have these management boards in the chassis, and then as you deploy multiple chassis like this, there's another server or some sort of an external management entity that's required to kind of manage the, whole, manage the whole ecosystem. And then think about uplinking this chassis. So, you know, you, you get a new chassis, you need some more blades, you need more footprint. You take the chassis, you, you know, you throw it in a rack, and you add all your parts. Then you've got to uplink everything. So from the fiber channel, I've got to uplink multiple cables to the fiber channel switching fabric. I have to uplink multiple network cables to the core distribution layer of the network, and then I've got to plug management into the management network. And so whenever you do this, you know, you have to call people and do things. So if you're a reasonable size organization, someone may manage the storage and storage fabric. When I plug this in as a server administrator, I've got to call them. We've got to zone things. We've got to get that ready. Network's the same way. We have to dedicate ports. We have to configure uplinking, VLAN trunking, and all that and I have to get IPs for management. 
And so usually it takes days, if not weeks, to deploy this. And, you know, at a previous position, I was a, you know, an enterprise architect, and, and we were looking at this, and this is what we, we saw as a real problem. Days are expensive. A chassis like this can be, you know, $40,000 easy, and it took a long time to get them deployed. Okay, every time we wrote another one, we had to re-uplink and attach everything. So that's a lot of infrastructure. So this is kind of a, you know, a logical diagram of a normal rack with traditional blade enclosures. So each enclosure has, you know, those five or six points of management. And then when we uplink those, often they go to top of rack or end of row switches. Lots of cabling, lots of IPs. I mean, looking at this right here, there's probably, you know, 20 IPs to manage easily in this configuration, which you think, well, 20 IPs, what's the big deal? But that's 20 places I have to do things. You know, each of these I have to do fiber channel zoning. I have to do VLAN configurations. I have to do access for management, all sorts of things. And so it becomes very burdensome. And, and I've, I've seen this myself when doing deployments of other things with blade chassis, you know, VMware deployments, and we don't have, you know, or we run into a problem where VLANs aren't being passed. And we go look, and the network admin will say, hey, you know, the core distribution, we're absolutely trunking those down. And then we find out it's a configuration problem in a chassis. And we find out that the switch or the pass-through module in the chassis isn't passing through the VLAN, and we have to dig in for that. And then often it becomes an issue of who owns the switches in the chassis against who owns the network equipment at the end of row. And that can, you know, it can quickly become a problem and fingers get pointed. Cisco took a different approach to their blade chassis system. They, they took almost all the infrastructure out of the chassis. If you look over to the right, you'll see that. So on the bottom, we've got five chassis. And in those chassis, we have no switches. There's no fiber channel switches. There's no data switches. All of that is handled by those two devices at the top that we call fabric interconnects. Those interconnects house all the management, all the connectivity to the outside world, storage fabrics, data fabrics, and they do all the connectivity down to the chassis. So they're really the brains of the operation if you think about it. So the nice thing here is that there's no new uplinking required when new chassis are deployed. So on day one when you deploy UCS, you put the two interconnects in the rack, you connect them to the chassis that you're deploying at the time, and then you connect them up to the distribution or core network and over to the storage fabric. And by doing that, you consolidate all that into those two devices. When you're ready to deploy your next chassis, you run cables up to the interconnects. You don't have to do trunking and port channels and all that stuff like we do with a traditional blade chassis. So people, you know, look at it and say, well, isn't that, isn't that sort of a bottleneck or a problem? And as we'll see when we start talking about these modules or these components, you'll see that it's really not. But the nice thing is, deployment time is very, very fast. I had a customer check this for me one day. I said, hey, you've got a new chassis in. It's sitting in a, you know, sitting on a pallet. Let me know how long it takes you to go from pallet to deploying servers in that new chassis. So they put it in the rack. They bolted it in, connected power, connected up to the interconnects. And when they got back to their desk, they were ready to deploy servers. And that total time was about 45 minutes. Why? Well, I mean, if you take a normal chassis and put it in a rack and power it up, you can do that fairly quickly, probably two hours maybe. But how long does it take you to interface with the storage team and the network team and configure all the trunking and the VLANs and passing all that? It takes a long time. With UCS, all that is configured on day one. You don't have to do it every time you deploy a chassis. Also, by removing the infrastructure from the chassis, it's fewer parts. Fewer parts means less power, and it also means far less management. If you see here, the total number of IP addresses for all the gear that you see is three. There's one for each interconnect, and then what we call cluster IP that you use for management. There's no IP addresses in all those chassis. There's no IP addresses for switches in the chassis because there's no switches. And we'll talk about this more, but it's a much simpler architecture. So here is an overview of the UCS components, starting at the top and working our way down. At the top, we have UCS Manager, or as we call it, UCSM. UCSM is the management interface. It's embedded in those two interconnects, and it's what you use to manage the entire ecosystem. So I'll open a browser, point it to the IP address of UCSM, launch a Java application, and that's where I do everything. If I have one chassis and one blade, or I have 10 chassis and 80 blades, 
I hit one IP address for the entire ecosystem. That's what's nice. There's no external management required. Everything is done via UCSM. UCSM runs on the UCS Fabric Interconnects, the second component there. There's a couple of different models of this. There's a 20 port, a 40 port, and a newer 48 unified port. And we'll get into details on those. But those are what sit at the top of rack. There's two of them for redundancy, connect up to the outside world and down to the server chassis. The third item is the UCS Fabric Extender, remote line card, as we say. Uh, this has a couple of names, Fabric Extender or FEX, F-E-X. Some people will refer to it as an I.O. module, but it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's a fabric extender that goes in the back of a chassis. So in the back of a chassis, you'll have two of those. One will go to one fabric extender, the other one will connect to the other fabric extender. It's what gives you connectivity from the chassis to the interconnects. That's done via 10 gig Ethernet on each port. There's one model with four ports and there's one model with eight ports. So you can have up to 40 gigabit or up to 80 gigabit on each I.O. module. That translates with two into a total of 80 or a total of 160. Remember what I said about this not really being a bottleneck? Well, this is why. Very fast connectivity. Next is the UCS blade server chassis. This is an eight slot chassis. It's eight half width blades or four full width blades and those uh, house all your servers. We'll look at those in more detail as well, but in the back of those are your I.O. modules and those go up to your interconnects. Then you have your UCS compute options, which are just your blades. There's several models of half width, several or a couple of models of full width. We'll go through those one by one. And then UCS virtual adapters, also known as mezzanine cards. Those are the I.O. modules that go into the blades. There's several different ones, but they all do 10 gig uh, 10 gig Ethernet. Most of them will also do fiber channel over Ethernet and we'll go into those in more detail here in just a second. So now let's look at each component in detail. We'll start with the fabric interconnects. There are currently two generations of fabric interconnects being sold. There's the original 6100 series and then there's the new 6200 series. The 6200 series isn't really replacing the 6100 at least not for a while uh, mainly because uh, there's some difference in sizing feature set and really costs that go along with these. So the 6100 is the original uh, interconnect offer and it comes in two different models. There's a 6120 which is a 20 port 1U device and there's a 6140 which is a 40 port 2U device and you see a picture of those down on the bottom right here. Each one of those has expansion module capability so when you know by default those 20 or 40 ports are really just uh, Ethernet but you add a module for additional Ethernet or storage connectivity or combination of both and we'll talk about those in a second but the 6120 has one module slot and the 614 or this I'm sorry the 60 yes 6140 has two module slots and you can mix and match just you know depending on what you want these guys also come with port licenses so you may be familiar with this if you've ever bought it like a Cisco MDS 9124 9148 something like that but by default, the 6120 comes with 8 licenses. The 6140 comes with 16. You license the Ethernet ports. So if I'm connecting up to the core network, those have to be licensed. If I'm connecting those down to server chassis, those have to be licensed. So when you buy a pair of these, you'll get you know, 2 by 8 or 2 by 16. If you add chassis and you hit a point where you're using 10 ports per 6120, you'll need to buy an additional four licenses, two per interconnect. So just keep that in mind when you're planning out your sizing and your scale. And we'll talk about this more in a minute when we talk about connectivity from the server chassis. As I talked about before, the interconnects handle all management. This is where UCS Manager resides. So when you connect to the UCS Manager IP, it's running on, on these two guys. And so the way these are set up, and we'll talk about this again more in depth in here in a little bit, but there's two interconnects for redundancy. They're both passing traffic. They're both active and active. So when you connect chassis, both sides are talking, functioning, and everything. They are active passive from a management point of view. So I, I think I mentioned this earlier, but you'll assign an IP address to one interconnect, then an IP address to the other interconnect, and then a third IP that's the cluster IP. And he belongs to whoever's the active interconnect, and the other one is passive. But for data purposes, they are active-active. For, for uh, management purposes, they are active-passive. 
Next are the modules. So the 6100 interconnect takes a couple of different modules here. And these are specific to the 6100s. These do not fit the 6200 series. So you have an option of four different ones. And again, 6120 can hold one, 6140 can hold two. They don't have to be the same two, so you can mix and match. So on the left, we have an eight port fiber channel module, one, two, or four gig fiber channel, whatever your you know, switching fabric is, it'll match up. Next is what we call the combo adapter. It is four port fiber channel and four port 10 gig ethernet. Nice thing here is those four 10 gig ethernet ports are already licensed. If you look at the cost of these, you'll see that that combo module is probably the most expensive, but that's because it includes four licenses as well. Moving along, we have a six port 10 gig ethernet module. So it's six more 10 gig ethernet ports. And finally, a six port one, two, four, or eight gigabit fiber channel module. So if you have an eight gigabit fabric and that's what you want to use, then you would buy the six port module, not the original eight port module. If you have eight gig fiber channel, that's the better option because six ports times eight is 48 gigabit, whereas eight port times four is only 32 gigabit. So you get more with less ports by using that module than you would with the 8-port module. And we now have the new 6200 series. Again, it's a second gen, but it's not replacing the original 6100. Currently, there's only one model out for this. It's the 6248 UP Universal Port. Uh, if you've seen the Nexus 5500 series from Cisco, the 10 gig storage and data switches, this is very similar to a 5548 UP. And the nice thing here is, is that there's no fiber channel modules or anything like that. Whatever SFP or pluggable module you put in a port, that's what he'll do. If you want to do 10 gig Ethernet, you plug that module in. If you want to do 8 gig fiber channel, you plug that module in. If you want to do 1 gig Ethernet, you can put that module in. It's completely up to you. It's also nice in that it is, you know, 48 port, which is basically double the density of a 6120, but it's only one U. Just lets you, you know, do more with less space. Now, by default, it's got 32 ports. So right here, these first two clusters of ports are built into the switch, and the one on the right is an additional module. So you can buy this with 32 ports, and then when you need more later, you just buy the 16-port module. So it's very flexible. Pricing is interesting because it's really, as of right now when I'm doing this, it's coming in between a 6120 and a 6140. So it's close enough that we're starting to see a lot of people just kind of gravitate toward the 6200. One thing that we'll talk about is versions of UCS Manager. The 6200 series requires the new version 2.0 of UCSM, whereas if a company is standardized on, say, 1.4, they can't go to a 6200 yet because it doesn't support 1.4. So that's just something to keep in mind you know, when you're looking at this. But if you don't have those restrictions, the 6200 is your best, most flexible option. Here's a chart comparing the different fabric interconnect models. And so you can kind of see, you know, the evolution on the 6248. The switching fabric throughput, 520 for the 6120 up to a terabit, uh, and then over to, you know, pretty much the same on the 6248. One thing I don't think I mentioned, but is, a, is something worth noting, one gigabit Ethernet port density. So, you know, you may not have 10 gigabit connectivity in the existing network, so you can absolutely connect at one gigabit. You know, we need to talk about things like oversubscription, and you need to look at that when we're, when we're looking at using one gig. But, you know, for small environments, it works just fine. But something to keep in mind is that on the 6120, the first eight ports can do gigabit. On the 6140s, the first 16 ports. But on the 6248, all of them can do gigabit. So, you know, I don't really expect to see somebody out there doing 24, 32 gigabit ports on the 6248. But it's something to keep in mind if you're looking at doing that. 10 gig port density, uh, 2652 and 48, those are with the uh, six port modules that you can add. Uh, 124 and 8 gigabit, you know, we talked about the 8 port fiber channel module against the 6 port 8 gigabit fiber channel module in the 6120s and 40s, so 612. And again, 6248, every port can do 8 gigabit fiber channel, you know. It's not going to do you a lot of good. You can't talk to servers, but it just points out that any port has any capability. Port to port latency has gotten better. Uh, that's just a switching st you know, statistic. Now it's down to two microseconds. Number of VLANs. This has become an issue with some people I've worked with. Uh, the 6120, 6140 can do up to 1,024, which you know is active number of VLANs. You can actually you know, absolutely have VLAN number 2019, 
but you can only have 1,024 active or configured. And we've run into some service provider customers with, you know, a lot of VLAN usage for, you know, maybe three or four VLANs per customer running into a VMware environment, and they have an issue. Now with the 6248, it's 4,096. Layer 3 ready, interesting idea. Uh, when we start really looking at the architecture, it'll kind of, you know, get your, get your wheels spinning on some things here, but the 6248 is Layer 3 ready. So just like the 5500 Nexus switches can do Layer 3 now, uh, Cisco's looking at adding Layer 3 in the future for the 6248 line. It's also 40 gigabit ready. So we'll be able to do some things, put in 40 gig modules, and add that to the 6248s. Uh, VIC support or virtual interface support. We'll talk about this more when we talk about the I.O. modules, especially in the network uh, lesson. But it's 15 per downlink on the 26100s and 63 per downlink on the 6248. Basically what that means is there are mezzanine adapters on blades that we can slice and dice up into virtual adapters. You have to have an X number or a certain number of uplinks or downlinks from the interconnect to the chassis to support a certain number of those you know, virtualized adapters. The 6248 gives you more of those. Finally, unified ports. We've already talked about this with the 6248. That's kind of its you know, premier feature set. Any port can really do anything that you want it to do. So next, we started at the interconnects at the top, and now we're talking about the chassis. The interconnects connect to the chassis using fabric extenders, or FEXs, also known as I.O. modules. A um, couple different names, but we'll call them fabric extenders or FEXs. I'll do my best not to say I.O. module, even though that's what Cisco originally called them, and I developed a bad habit. But there are two generations of these. There's the 2100 series, which is the original, and then when the 6248 came out, they released the 2200 series, and we'll talk about those in a second. So there's two of these in each chassis. Uh, the one on the left is what's known as FEX A or Fabric A. The one on the right is known as FEX B or Fabric B. And so a FEX, like the one on the left, all those ports will connect to one interconnect. You don't take four ports out of the back of this interconnect, a maximum of four, and split some to one interconnect and some to the other. That's not how this functions. You will connect one, two, or four of those ports on the back to one of the interconnects and then one, two, or four to the other interconnect. And so normally we develop what we call fabrics. If you're familiar again with Fiber Channel, you'll know normally you have two fabrics. You have an A fabric and a B fabric, completely separate. That's how UCS works. And we'll have a diagram here in a little bit that outlines this. But again, one FEX to one interconnect. They uplink the chassis to the interconnect. And they do that by using 10 gig Ethernet for data and fiber channel over Ethernet for fiber channel connectivity. Uh, I keep talking about fiber channel. I'll talk about it more. It's not a requirement for UCS. So if you're this far into the lesson, you're like, man, we don't, we don't use fiber channel. That's fine. But it has the capability of doing fiber channel over Ethernet or FCOE via the same connections. So these are four port models. They're known as the 2104 XP. And there are four 10 gig FCOE ports. And we have what are known as eight server facing backplane ports. So if you think about this thing, the four ports you see right there are, you know, outside connectivity up to the interconnect. Think of internal, you know, they're in the traces of the board, but inside it has eight 10 gig ports. And those eight 10 gig ports go to the eight half width server options in the chassis. If you have a full width blade, you have two I or two mezzanine adapters for a total, you know, the same number of, of blades, but each I.O. module or each fax goes four 10 gig connections out to the interconnects and there's eight ports that connect to the internal blade mezzanine adapters. So that's why we say it has eight server facing backplane ports. On the back of this connection for oh, into the, going to the interconnects, you can wire one, two, or four ports on each fax. You can't wire three. Three is an unsupported configuration. Why? Think about it. Um, I've got eight blades. On each half width blade, I have a mezzanine adapter. On that adapter, and we'll go over this in more detail soon, there's two 10 gig ports. One 10 gig port is wired to FEX A, one 10 gig port is wired to FEX B. That's why we have eight server facing backplane ports on each one. So if I have my chassis full, eight going to A, eight going to B, I can divide eight by one, 
So if I have one uplink port, all eight of the FEX A uh, ports go up that one cable. If I wire two, I take eight, I divide it by two, and I get four each. Four of them go up one cable, four of them go up the other cable. We, they're pinned to a specific uplink port. And if I have eight divided by four, then it's two, 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 and two. You can't divide eight by three. So even if I, you say, well, Jason, what happens if I have three blades? You know, I've only put three blades in a chassis. That's three ports going to one fax, three going to the other. Why can't I do three? Because UCS just doesn't function like that. It's If you have, you know, two ports uplinked with three blades, it's going to hash them, you know, one over the first one, one over the second one, and one over the first one again. And then when you add, you know, those other ports to go to four, it'll rehash. But by default, you cannot have three connections. So keep that in mind uh, as you do your deployment or as you go take an exam, something like that. But FEX A goes to one interconnect, FEX B goes to the other interconnect, and one, two, or four ports total. We now have a second gen extender, the 2208 XP. So it's very similar to the 2104, but it's eight external ports, so you have eight ports going up to the interconnects, and 32 server facing backplane ports. So this thing has a lot of throughput, a lot of throughput if you look at it. I mean, each one has 80 gigabit of external and 32 server facing backplane ports, so you know, 320 server facing backplane ports. And we'll talk about what you can do with those with, you know, only eight blades here in a minute, but just keep that in mind. Now, on as far as interconnect usage, you can use the 2208 with a 6100 as well as a 6200. It does not require a 6200 interconnect, but if you look at it, that's a lot of ports. If you start connecting all eight, that's a lot of ports, especially on, say, a 6120. But the nice thing is, if you come tomorrow and buy a new chassis, and now the 2208 is offered, you can order it with that, and a couple, you know, a year or two years from now, if you decide to upgrade your interconnects, you already have that capability. So you're not shoehorned into an old environment. If you bought UCS on day one, when the only thing offered was a 6100 interconnects, you're not stuck with buying 2104 XP fixes for the rest of your environment's life until you upgrade. So you get that flexibility. On the back, you have a couple of cabling options. Now remember on the 2104, I said one, two, or four. Here, it's one, two, four, or eight. The same math division rules apply. So it's one, two, four, or you go all in at eight cables. The neat thing here is that you can say, you know, where I talked about it a minute ago, how a blade is pinned to an uplink. So, you know, when we hash out and blade one will go, you know, up the first cable port and blade two would go through the next one, and it would kind of load balance like that. Well, you know, the way that works is great, and with four cables, we would have, you know, two blades on first one, two blades on second one, two, 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 and two. What happens if blades, the first blades on the uplink one are really busy and the rest aren't? Well, that's just too bad. We can do some manual overrides that we'll talk about later called pin groups, but for the most part, people don't do that, and so you're just kind of stuck with what it gives you and hope for the best. With the 2208, we can do port channels. That means that I can take four or eight of these cables that are going up to an interconnect and say, hey, I want to do these as a port channel. And then it starts doing balance load balancing based on connections across the uplinks, not pinning a blade to a port. So it just gives you more granular bandwidth control. That requires a 2208. You cannot do that with a 2104. So that requires a second gen fex. So the second gen fex gives you eight external ports, 32 internal ports, and the capability of doing port channels. And then the chassis. So the chassis is known as a 5108. That's just the UCS model number, but if you go order one, it's called a 5108. It is a very simple chassis. There's no internal switches. I'll show you again in a diagram in a few minutes, but the facts do not do switching. That means if blade one needs to send a frame to blade number two, it goes up to the interconnect and back down. And I'll show you that in the architecture diagram I have in just a minute, but there's no IP addresses on that FEX. You can't talk to it. You can't do anything to it. You don't have to go in and set VLAN capabilities. All that's done at the interconnect level. So the chassis are very simple. They hold up to eight half-width blades. You'll see that on the bottom left uh, picture, or four full-width blades at the center picture. But you don't have to do them like that. You could have 
four half-width blades and two full-width blades, or one full-width blade and six half-width blades. It doesn't matter. It also doesn't matter that all your chassis across the environment are the same. So you could have one chassis full of half, one chassis full of full, a third chassis mix and match, and a fourth chassis uh, also mix and match. UCS Manager doesn't care, the interconnects don't care, the chassis don't care. It's one of the advantages of Cisco's UCS B series. Uh, some of the other blade platforms to do external management and do a full, take advantage of all the features, your chassis have to match configuration. Not so with UCS. Doesn't matter on your blade configurations. So each one of these supports up to four power supplies. So down at the bottom, and I'll have a better diagram in a second, you get four power supplies for what we call N plus one and grid redundancy. N plus one is very simple. If I run a power calculator, which I have a link to later, and it shows you, you know, you need two power supplies to fully populate this chassis, you put in three, and that's your N plus one configuration. You can fail one, the other one takes over. Or you can do grid redundancy, which is two of the power supplies go to one power feed, the other two power supplies go to the other power feed, and you can fail an entire, say, generator, UPS, PDU, whatever you may have, and everything will still run. You just tell it that, hey, power supplies one and two are this power grid, three and four are that power grid. There's eight fan modules with two fans each for 16 total. Here and over here. Hot swappable, of course, just like the power supplies and the fexes, actually, all that is hot swappable. And two bays for 2100 or 2200 fexes in the rear of the chassis. We saw those right here and right here. So here's kind of a, you know, you know, kind of a characterized view here of the environment. So at the top, we have two interconnects. They are redundant. They have redundant fan and redundant power, hot swappable on both. Down, we have the front view of the chassis here with half width blades and full width blades. And down at the bottom are the front port four power supplies. So you actually slide those out from the front or slide them in to put them in. Here's the rear view. So we have our power connections here, two and two. This would be your I.O. modules. These are your standard ports. We have console ports. Again, if you're a Cisco person, you know console ports. We'll talk about how you do the basic configuration via the console port. And then we have management and cluster ports. So again, I talked about these are connected for cluster purposes for management. You will connect cables from directly from one to the other. We'll talk about that in a later lesson. Then you have your chassis. So you have your four fan modules on this side and four on this side. Spots for your four, eight, 10 gig connections, depending on your fax and power entry here in the back. Uh, Cisco has a myriad of power cable options there. You know, make sure you get the right one is, is only advice I can give you because it varies by environment, but um, that'll, you know, pretty much any power cable to cover anything. But that's the front and this is the back. So it's very simple. You know, you can build one of these chassis up in just a few minutes. There's not a lot of configuration that's needed once you get the interconnects online. Now let's talk about blades. So there's a lot of blades that are offered for the UCS series, but they kind of match a lot of what other vendors are doing for blades and for servers. So there's nothing too crazy that they do. It's just important to understand kind of where they fit, what their use cases are, and kind of, you know, how you position a blade. So the first blade, and these all start with B, like B200 or something like that, is the B200M2. So B200 is a model of blade. It's the standard dual socket half width blade. M2 means basically Gen 2. So if you're an HP guy, you know, you might have a G6 or a G7. This is an M2, second gen. The original was the M1. Go, go figure. So this is the workhorse blade. At my company, we sell these more than anything else. And Cisco is the same way. Uh, there's a lot of VMware out there running on B200 blades. It's just the standard blade offering for almost everything. It's very popular. It's half width, so you can put eight of them in a chassis. And it's dual socket Intel 5600 CPU, so you can do right now, as of today, you can do six cores per CPU for 12 cores per server. Uh, 12 DIMM slots. Uh, you can do the 16 gig DIMMs and do 192 gig of RAM on each one of these. And if you kind of look at it, if you're again a VMware person, you look at like Enterprise Plus licensing, it kind of fits this blade very well. This blade holds two small form factor hard drives right here and right here, and it supports a single mezzanine adapter. Remember, we talked a little bit about those kind of uh, 
the modules or the cards that go on the blade that gives you your 10 gig ports. This has a single adapter. Each adapter has two 10 gig ports, one going to FEX A, one going to FEX B. So you can do 12 cores, 192 gig of RAM, two hard drives, and an aggregate throughput of 20 gigabit per blade with this guy. Here's kind of an inside view of this half width blade. The mezzanine card is at the very back. It's your two 10 gig connections. You have memory slots here and here, and CPUs here and here, and your hard drive bays up front. Uh, we'll talk about it more in the storage sections and, and deploying servers, but it's very common to see UCS without hard drives doing things like boot from SAN. So it's, it's not uncommon to see these without, but some people still do boot from local. We'll talk about pros and cons of that later. Next is the B250 M2. So he's a second generation B250. It's a full width blade. Um, so you can put up to four of them in a single chassis. And this is normally considered to be a VDI blade or a virtual desktop infrastructure blade. If you're not familiar with virtual desktops, it's especially running on you know something like VMware or Hyper-V. The idea with these is, is that desktops running as virtual machines don't take a lot of resources. So we can stack them very deep. Whereas we may limit servers to somewhere 30 to 40 on a pretty consolidated environment, we'll do 100 to 150 virtual desktops on a blade. They don't use a lot of CPU, but they do use some RAM. I mean, 150 VMs, even at a gig or two gigs, that's a lot of memory. So this is considered to be a VDI blade because of its extended memory support. So it's dual socket Intel 5600, same CPUs as the B200M2, but it has 48 DIMM slots. Take a look at the picture down here. See all this? Those are DIMMs. Lots and lots of DIMMs. Right now, that blade is certified with 8 gig DIMMs, and you get 384 gig per blade. So if you kind of compare this to the B200, um, you're probably thinking, well, well gee, Jason, I, I can buy a B200 with 192, and that's a half width, so I buy two of those, I get the same RAM, but double the CPU. And that's right. Um, this was probably more popular back when the B200 was not certified with 16 gig DIMMs and would only do 8s, but it's also still cheaper to do one of these instead of two B200s, plus you, if you look at licensing, say VMware per socket licensing, you're not paying, you know, four sockets of licensing with this, you're still paying two. So you have to kind of weigh out your pricing and weigh out what your use cases are. Uh, just like the B200, this has two small form factor hard drives, but unlike that, it has two mezzanine adapters. So if you look down here again, here's one, here's the other. So this has 40 gigabit of aggregate throughput. So it's a lot of throughput for a single blade. I have no idea if this is going to be certified with 16 gig DIMMs. By the time you're listening to me right now, it very well could be. I have not heard that much from Cisco yet. Uh, it's possible. But again, this is an extended memory blade. And what I mean by that is Cisco developed their own silicone. They didn't license it from anybody for these blades. And so it allows you to do more memory in a two socket system than really anybody else. And while some other competitors are starting to encroach on that, one thing about their custom silicone is that you can fill these blades up and still run a very high memory speed. Whereas other servers and other blades, when you fill up the memory slots, you have to cut the memory speed off and back to like 800 megahertz. So that's one of the advantages of Cisco's extended memory support. Again, it's all about what your use case are and your requirements are and then kind of price out what your options are. Here's a cutaway view of that uh, of the B250 blade. So on the back we have two mezzanine cards. Remember, each of these has two 10 gig ports each, so that's a total of 40 gigabit of aggregate throughput. And an also, by the way, I don't think I mentioned this a minute ago, you don't have to populate both of these cards. So you can put one in and not the other, but it's going to, you know, you, you're taking up space in the chassis, so you might as well go ahead and use it, but it's not a requirement. I've seen people do that with a single blade. The only gotcha is make sure when you install it, you put it in the right port. So that'll be in the install guide, and you want to make sure you put it in the right, in the right port. If you put it in the wrong one, the blade's not going to come up. So just keep that in mind. Along with the mezzanine adapters, you've got a total of 48 DIMM slots. That's a lot of memory expansion. And I know, you know, 384 gig is not, you know, it's, it's not a whole lot for the amount of room this blade takes in the chassis, but also with 48 DIMM slots, you can use like 8 gig DIMMs 
and not have the expense of doing it with 16 gig DIMM. So again, that comes into your cost model. Two Intel 5600 CPUs and two small form factor drive base. Next is the B230 M2, second generation B230. Uh, the reason I put this one kind of third instead of between the other two, even though the numbers are a little different, is he's a very different blade. I call him the Goldilocks blade because he's not too big, he's not too little, he kind of fits somewhere between a B200 and a B250. Very, very powerful. And it's a half width form factor. He has a dual socket Intel E7 CPU. So these CPUs right now can do up to 10 cores each. So you can put 20 cores on a half width blade. And it has 32 DIMM slots. With 16 gig DIMMs, you'll do half a terabyte of RAM on a single half width blade. Uh, instead of normal small form factor hard drives due to the space constraint inside this guy with all those DIMM slots, um, you only have you have room for two solid state drives. Along with that, it's a single mezzanine adapter, half with blade, single mezzanine adapter, two 10 gig ports. So you're probably thinking, well, who in their right mind is going to buy a B250, right? Look at this. I can do half a terabyte of RAM. I can use 16 gig DIMMs. I can do you know two solid state drives. Why would I buy the buy a 250 over this? Well, it's price. And now for the big boy. So this is the B440M2, the second generation 440. And he's considered to be the big blade. You can see a picture over there on the right. It's a full width blade. This is the quad socket blade. So he uses the quad socket Intel E7 4800 CPUs. Right now, those guys are 10 cores each, 10 physical cores. 10 cores, four CPUs, 40 cores in a single blade. Along with that, you get 32 DIMM slots. So they take 16 gig DIMMs. We can do half a terabyte of RAM and 40 physical cores on a single full width blade. That's an amazing amount of processing power in a single blade element. It has four small form factor hard drive slots and since it's a full width blade it can do two mezzanine adapters. And so that'll do, you know, with the standard mezzanine adapters, again, 40 gigabit of aggregate throughput with those. So these are used a lot of times in large database blades, data warehousing, things like that. Don't see them a lot with just, you know, Windows running on hardware, just, you know, standard servers, Exchange, things like that, or even for VMware. It's usually specialized use case, large Oracle environments, DB2, things like that. So, you know, that's usually what these are for. They're very expensive. You know, we talked about the E7 CPUs on the 230. These are, you know, just as bad as those guys are. But for the right environment, they're absolutely what you need to get the job done. So here's a quick breakdown of all the compute element options that Cisco has. And you'll notice down at the bottom there's a list of rack mount servers, and I'll talk about those in just a second. At the top are all your B-series blade options, your 200, your 250, your 230, and your, two, and your uh, 440. It tells you the sockets, the CPU type, disks, and memory capacity. Then you have the rack mount, what is known as the C-series. We haven't talked about those yet, but Cisco does offer rack mount servers. They're very good. Full lights out management, you know, fully supported just like any other rack mount server. So there's a list of models there, and they kind of, you know, except for disk, kind of match up to the B-series blades, but you can put a lot more disk in these rack mount servers. Also, one thing that a lot of people, you know, have, don't really realize is that you can actually put rack mount servers in this UCS B-series environment. It's not a popular option. It's limiting. It's kind of expensive, but you can take one of these and put it under the interconnects and manage it with UCS Manager and get a lot of the features. Downside is it takes more infrastructure. You have to put what's called a Nexus 2000 underneath that 6000 interconnect. And then you'll run a cables or cables from the server to the 2000 and then 10 gig connections up to the interconnect. So it's more cabling and it's very port intensive. It's just not something we see often and and right now you have to run an older version of UCSM. I believe the newest supported release to do this is 1.3. Uh, in the 1 series, the latest is 1.4, and we also now have UCSM2, which is what's required for the 6200 interconnect. So it just hasn't got a lot of traction, but I want you to understand that there are rack mount servers. This, this course is primarily on the B series, but Cisco does offer C series as well. And now for the mezzanine adapters, input and output. These are what get a data in and get them out of your blades. So each blade can choose from a selection. 
several different makes, several different models. We'll talk about what you do, you know, why you choose the ones you choose. Full width blades have two adapter ports, so you can take two mezzanine adapters and put it on the blade. Uh, I'm assuming you can mix and match. That's actually something that I haven't really put a lot of thought of or thought into. I've never seen that done. Normally people try to stay with the same mezzanine adapters. There's really no reason not to, um, but probably a supported option. Half width blades can only have one mezzanine adapter. They only have one port. Not all adapters support fiber channel. Some are Ethernet data only. The big question on choosing one is normally down to be aware of your operating system and which mezzanine adapters have drivers for that OS. There's an interoperability matrix for blades and adapters, and I've got the link right there. It's updated by Cisco. And we have seen new mezzanine adapters get support for older generations of operating systems, so it is worth checking out and make sure you understand and make sure that they match up. I want to talk about one other thing real quick, and uh, we haven't gone through all these mezzanine adapter options yet, but you can use this as a reference to come back to. But mezzanine adapters support what is called hardware failover. And what I mean by that is, if you remember, we talked about how blades have mezzanine adapters on them, and there's usually two ports. One port goes to FEX A, one port goes to FEX B. FEX A connects to one interconnect, FEX B connects to the other interconnect. What happens if you lose all connectivity to an internet connect. All the cables or ports fail, the FEX fails, or the interconnect itself fails, something like that. Well, you have two options. One is no hardware failover support. When that fabric A side goes down, the OS on the blade says, oh, I just lost a port over there. I guess I need to figure out what to do. And so normally you'll put some sort of a teaming driver or an OS solution or VMware to be, you know, active standby or active active interfaces into a V switch, whatever, but it's up to the OS to figure it out. The other option is hardware failover support. So you'll check a box in UCS Manager that says enable this and should Fabric A fail internally to the chassis it will redirect all ports that go to Fabric A to Fabric B. So all of a sudden you now have, you know, double the number of ports on your Fabric B side and you know keep things in mind like bandwidth and all that but the OS is none the wiser. Nice thing is, you don't have to do things like OS level teaming drivers and stuff like that. But again, it's just kind of an architectural decision. Normally we like hardware failover. It's clean and it's simple. It also used to have some things to think about. Uh, it used to be that you did not enable hardware failover for VMware. And there are reasons for that. Mainly that when it failed a fabric from one side to the other, it didn't do what we call a gratuitous ARP, meaning Again, you have Fabric A going up to the switches, Fabric B going up to your network switches, and the switches know where the MAC addresses of a blade's Ethernet port is. So, you know, your core switch used to know that, hey, the MAC address for this went down through interconnect A to fix A into a blade. When it would fail that to B, the chassis and the blades never sent out a gratuitous ARP, meaning it never sent out a broadcast that let things know upstream in the network that you had moved ports and what would happen is we'd call it, you'd, you'd get what's called black holing of traffic. So your switches up top, until they saw a frame come up through interconnect B, assumed the blade was still on A and would keep sending data down and it would never make it. Now with newer versions of UCSM, you can absolutely do hardware failover with VMware. But it's just something to keep in mind. So I always say you want to run 1.4 or 2.0 if you can and try to keep take advantage of these new features. So... The following adapters support hardware failover. The M81KR, what we've known as the Palo adapter, the new VIC-1280, and we'll talk about those two here in a second, and then the first generation CNA, what's known as the M71KR. The dash E and the Q are Emulex and QLogic, depending on the chipset. What's interesting is the second gen, M72, does not support hardware failover. So if you buy one of those today with the new current gen, they don't do it. The old M61s and M51s do not support it, as well as the old Intel 8259KR, 8259.8KR. So it's 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 something to keep in mind. I know it seems like there's a lot of things here and a lot of SKUs, and we'll talk about these here right now. But there's an updated list of kind of this matrix of features right there on that URL that I gave you. And we'll again in a second we're going to talk about why. There's really only a couple adapters here you need to worry about. They cover 98% of use cases out in the world, and the rest of these don't matter, but keep this as a reference.
So the first adapter we'll talk about is the M72KR E and Q, and that's the Emulex and QLogic, or the M61KR Intel. So these are CNAs, Converge Network Adapter Cards. Commonly see CNAs in rack mount servers. So the reason they're called Converge Network Adapters is they do Ethernet and fiber channel over Ethernet through the same cable. So you have plug in one 10 gig cable and I get storage and I get data over the same thing. That's why it's converged. They are standard CNA adapters. So if you go buy an Emulex or QLogic CNA, the chips on those are pretty much the chips on these. Feature sets the same. I just talked a second ago that there's no hardware failover for the M72s. So you'll need to do something like uh, Emulex or QLogic supplied teaming you know, type of driver for Windows or Linux or if you use VMware. Uh, let VMware handle the failover in the vSwitch. There's no uh, virtual interface configuration, so you can't take one of these and slice it, dice it up into 20 different NICs or 20 HBAs like we can with some of the other adapters we'll talk about. The Intel adapter, the M61KRI, and I believe the Emulex and the QLogix now can do what's known as SRIOV. Basically, it's uh, IO virtualization that does allow this splitting of virtual interfaces, but it's not at the UCS level, meaning it's not controlled through UCSM, it's controlled through vendor supplied tools, and it's not supported with, say, VMware. VMware currently does not support SR SRIOV in vSphere 5. So it's not something you see used a lot. The nice thing is wide operating system support. There's a lot of driver support out there for these CNA cards. So this is often our fallback position should. Uh, an operating system not support one of the other cards. It's often used when the VIC, discussed here in a second, is not supported. VIC being the virtual interface card, kind of the all full feature set card. So again, this is kind of our fallback position. The previous gen was called an M71KR, and that did support hardware failover. Again, the M72 does not. M51KRB, B meaning Broadcom, this is 10 gig Ethernet only. No fiber channel or Ethernet support. Uh, no virtual interface support. Has a lot of operating system support. Broadcom's very popular. This is their standard 10 gig chipsets. And it's just basically used when you don't need FCOE and or legacy operating system support is required. Uh, it's just not a common card. Again, it would have to be something that doesn't need FCOE or is so limited on drivers that this is really the option that you have to go with. Now for the M81KR, what's known as the Palo card. That was the code name for this card. Uh, you'll hear people talk about the Palo card all the time. This is the original UCS VIC virtual interface card. We have deployed a lot of these cards, especially in VMware environments. These were the go-to mezzanine adapter. And there's a few reasons for that. First, it fully supports 10 gig Ethernet and FCOE, but it's a VIC. It's a virtual interface card. So I can divide this guy up into all sorts of virtual NICs or virtual HBAs. So on port 1, I can do about up to 56 devices, same on port 2. Why do I want to do that? Well, let's take VMware as an example. I'm a VMware guy. It applies to Hyper-V, applies to a lot of things, but I'm a VMware guy. So often what we do with this card is we will take a port and say port connected effects A and we will have a management virtual NIC, a vMotion virtual NIC. If we do NFS or iSCSI storage, we'll do one of those vNIC. So we split it up so that we can segment traffic, we can do quality of service or rate limiting or something like that on the virtual NIC. So instead of VMware seeing two 10 gig ports, it may see you know, 12 10 gig ports, depending on what we want to do, but it's still two physical interfaces on that card. Very flexible. Um, if you've ever used like HP's, you know, Flex 10 and Virtual Connect type systems, it's, it's similar, more powerful and more uh, configurable, but kind of along that mindset. The downside to the Palo card is operating system support. It mostly supports modern current OSs, though we have seen some older drivers released. I suggest you look at that compatibility matrix. See it a lot with VMware and current versions of Windows and Red Hat or SUSE Linux. So again, exceedingly popular option. This has been the go-to card, except when legacy operating support just wasn't there and we had to go with something else. The second gen VIC card is known as a 1280. So this was just released when the 6248s were released. Uh, so second generation VIC and 
it is exceedingly powerful, right? It's 80 gig per host. So there's four 10 gig ports going to one fex, four 10 gig ports going to the other. And I know during my blade examples, I kept saying, you know, 10 and 10 or 20 or 40 aggregate. This guy is brand new. He will let you do 80 gig aggregate for a single card. So it's just an insane amount of throughput. I mean, think about putting two of these on a full width blade. It supports 10 gig ethernet and FCOE. It, again, just like the Paolo card, this one doesn't have a cool code name, it's just the VIC-1280, but just like the Paolo card, you can slice and dice them up and do like 116 interfaces. Uh, it's just very flexible. Back at the same problem we had with Paolo, supports mostly modern current operating systems, but we're going to see this used a lot with VMware, Windows, and Linux going forward. It's kind of going to take the place of that Paolo card. Uh, this does require a 2208 XP FEX. So if you want to use these, you have to have the 2208 FEXs in the back of your chassis. Both the Palo and the 1280 support hardware failover. Did you get all that? I mean, that's a lot of components. So that's a lot of things to think about. And I want to kind of now talk about how these things interrelate and are connected. So it's a lot of pieces, but when you look, stand back, you know, 20, 30 feet away from this environment, you really only see a couple of major components. So First of all, let's take a look at how this works. Here we have your fabric interconnects. This is a cluster. So these are clustered together. You see these two cables here, here, cluster them, connect them for clustering capability. I'll talk about the interconnects in more detail when we start talking about configuration in a later lesson, but almost every time these are configured like this. And what I mean is, is that they are connected for clustering but not for data. There's no 10 gig data cables between these two. And there are reasons for that. Mainly, if you look at this at the network side, if I connected these, I would have a loop. What do we use to prevent loops? Spanning tree. And spanning tree is a bad word in a lot of data centers, especially to the network administrators. With the standard deployment of UCS, the interconnects are switches, but they're not switches, meaning they switch frames. They do a lot of things a switch does switch frames, but they don't do something like spanning tree for loop prevention because there's no connectivity. We connect these up to storage, fabric A, fabric B, and we cross connect them to the network. So we have each interconnect goes to each of the core switches or these could be distribution or aggregation, whatever you do for your environment, and they're cross connected. We have chassis here, and I have 2204s or 2104s as an example from the left. Going to one air connect, the right goes to the other. Remember, we do not cross connect the fabric extenders. Now, in a blade, one side is connected to the FEX A, one side is connected to FEX B. So let's talk a little bit about that. What happens if port A here wants to talk to port B there? Well, I go up here, here, down to the interconnect, and back to this blade. So there's some things we have to worry about, meaning, if you do a lot of traffic from port A to port B in another chassis, we need, you need to think about that. You need to look at how you're architecting that and see if that's a good idea. If this was A on this blade to B on this blade, it would just go up to the interconnect, back and uh, back down. Actually, no, it wouldn't. It would still go up, over, and back just like it would to a different chassis. So you need to be aware of how your uplinks are pinned. Uh, that makes a difference. When we do deployments of UCS, especially with, say, VMware again, and we look at how we do vMotions, we want to make sure that a vMotion that's going out and interface on Fabric A stays on Fabric A. Because if it wants to go from A from this blade to A to this blade, it'll go up and back and over here because all the switching's done on the interconnect, but it never leaves the interconnect. I don't want high-speed low latency vMotion traffic to be crossing the network core unless it absolutely has to. And the only time it really should is if, say, you know, one of the fabrics goes down or there's a problem and we still have to hop the core. So that's some things to keep in mind uh, with UCS and how you deploy it. Let's take a little bit more uh, in-depth look here. So this may, you know, kind of help you out a little bit on that discussion. So again, we have our interconnects. We have our cross connection for clustering. We have a blade here in a chassis with a mezzanine card. One port goes to A, 
one port goes to B. This is a full width blade with two mezzanine cards, but the rules apply. A, B, A, and B. On the interconnects, we have some ports that we defined. Things that go to storage are storage ports, simple. Things that go up to the network are called network ports. And things that go to servers are called server ports. And we define those on the interconnect, and you'll see that in a later lesson. But traffic flow, again, is everything is switched by the interconnect. So up here, and either across or back down. So is that a bottleneck? You'll hear a lot of, you know, kind of uh, UCS competitors talk about how that's a bottleneck, and it's really not. A couple of things to keep in mind. The distance from here up and back is usually 5 meters, 15 feet. So it's a speed of light there and a speed of light back. There's really no latency at all on this connection. And if you looked at a traditional blade chassis, a blade chassis with blades in it, when I'm switching traffic from one blade to another, it still has to bounce off that internal switch in the chassis. And so it's still got to make a hop and then make a hop to the other blade. Same thing here with UCS. With UCS, I get to choose how many of these ports on the FEX, 1, 2, or 4, and if this was a 228, 1, 2, 4, 8, how many do I want to connect and what do I want my throughput to be? So those are decisions you get to make. You can do as much as you want or as little as you need. And so you, you know, that defines your configuration. Connectivity in and out of the interconnects is, you know, if you want a lot of connectivity, if you want a lot of throughput to the core, you run more 10 gig cables. Uh, we do a minimum of two is our standard deployment because if this guy, if Fabric A loses all uplinks to the core, he will fail this fabric to the other side. He basically sends all ports down notice to the FEX and these come offline. So you don't want a single port or module or cable to cause the FEX to go offline. So we do a minimum of two. If you want more, add more. If you want eight, put eight. Um, there is some, usually some amount of oversubscription. But if you're a networking person, you understand that oversubscription is a normal thing. Two to one, four to one, eight to one, depending on what you're doing, is a very normal thing. Most people uh, are not doing more than, say, 40 gigabit of traffic in and out to the core. Uh, I refer to this traffic going up and back to the core as north and southbound traffic. They're not doing nearly that much. They may be doing a lot of traffic between chassis, what I call east and west traffic, but that again is switching the interconnects and back down, and it's not going across the core. So when you're doing a UCS design, or when you're looking at how to deploy this in your environment, you need to keep these things in mind and look at how much traffic you think is going to be exiting the environment and coming back and just size it accordingly. It's not a flaw, it's not a limitation. But like all good designs, there are constraints and design considerations that you have to keep in mind, and UCS is no different. So let's take a look at a couple things. We've kind of harped on this a little bit, but I want to kind of spell this out. So some available connectivity and bandwidth options. So at the top, we've got our two interconnects, cross-connected again for management clustering. And so you can do two, two ports total per chassis, two by one links for 20 gigabit. You can do two by two. 40 gigabit, 2 by 4, 80 gigabit, or with the new one, 2 by 8, 160 gigabit. So it is flexible. Now, you can have an environment just as you see right here, meaning if I choose the first chassis is only going to have two links total, that doesn't mean all my chassis have to have two links total. I can have one with two, one with four, one with eight, one with 16. Completely up to you. Often, if this is, say, a VMware environment, People will have all chassis be the same, so as VMs get floated around, there's no change in quality of service. But you may have two chassis with VMware with one uplink profile. You may have another two chassis for something like uh, a different sort of cluster environment, SAP or something, that may have more connections than the VMware. It doesn't matter. It's completely up to you and how you configure it. And so you get to use the ports, the best, you know, the best use case. And if you say, you know what, today I'm going to do two and two, and then you fill up that chassis a year later, you just walk back there, plug in the rest of the cables, and they will become active, some things will be repinned, but you'll then be able to move to four and four. So you just doubled your throughput in now the chassis, and all you did was plug in some cables. So that's the advantage of UCS. A lot of these things are done, and you, you can change them later, but usually it's done day one, and you don't have to worry about it. So now let's do a couple of common questions that I get about UCS deployment. So first of all, 
are the interconnect switches. So when I talk to UCS to customers, I normally am talking to server guys, I'm talking to network guys, I'm talking to storage teams, and the network guys are always like, are those switches? Yes and no. And that's, you know, if you ask a pre-sales guy like me a question, it's always either it depends or yes and no. So yes and no. They do switch frames, but in the default configuration, and we'll talk about the two configuration options, they do not run spanning tree. There's an option for them to turn them into full-fledged switches, but it's a, usually a bad idea. But in their default config, they are, they are switches, but since they are not cross-connected for data, they do not need to run spanning tree. It's really, to the network, they look like a host with a bunch of MAC addresses off of it. And if you're a VMware person, it's very, very much the same. A vSwitch is a switch, but it's not doing things like cross-connection, and it's not flooding things out all interfaces, and it doesn't create loops, so it doesn't have to run spanning tree. Are the interconnects connected? Ooh, look, yes and no. Told you. Uh, they are connected for management clustering, but don't pass data in the default configuration. If data needs to go from one fabric to the other, it must pass over the outside network. And that's where I talked about you need to keep kind of your design and your architecture in mind. If you have something talking to, from fabric A to B, you need to look at why you're doing that and see if you can fix that problem. So yes, they have two one gig cables between them, but they're just for management clustering. If there are no switches in the chassis, does it impact performance? No. See, not even a yes and a no, just a no. The interconnect switch frames and do the intelligent processing. It's no different than a traditional chassis sending frames to an internal switch. Those couple of feet on the interconnects between my chassis and my interconnects only add, you know, or add no measurable latency. It's the speed of light up and back, five meters one way, five meters back. You know, 30 feet is not any measurable time at that, that distance. So, no, they do not, and it's not an impact or anything like that. Now, if I run one uplink to each interconnect and I'm trying to put 30 gigabit of data per second through it, is that a problem? Yeah, that's a problem and you need to add more connections. But as long as everything is done correctly and sized appropriately, and you can see that within UCSM, you will have no issue. If the two fabric interconnects are a cluster, is it an active-active or active-passive cluster? And this kind of goes back to some of the first questions. So on the management side, they're active-passive. One of the interconnects will be primary and one will be subordinate or standby. That just means that when I type in the IP address of that cluster for UCSM, one of the two is going to answer. They both can't hold the same IP address. It's much like any other active-passive cluster. If the current active interconnect fails, the subordinate takes over, grabs that IP address, and continues on. From a LAN and SAN I.O. perspective, they are both active. So, Fabric A, Fabric B are passing traffic up and back and all around at all times. Uh, you can send up and come back, not a problem. It's not active standby from a data or I.O. perspective. Well, that's it for this lesson. It's a lot of stuff in this lesson, a lot of parts, a lot of things to keep in mind. This is probably one of the more meaty lessons that you're going to have during this course. But it's an extremely important lesson because we covered all sorts of things about components and modules and how they connect and how they talk and what the architecture looks like. It's a lot of stuff. So we started talking about, you know, how UCS is different and how kind of Cisco came around with the mindset and what they did in Project California. And we compared it to some of the traditional blade enclosures. We looked at, you know, how little infrastructure actually in a UCS ecosystem compared to a lot of other traditional server or chassis platform. Then we did a quick overview of the components. You remember that big list starting at the top of the UCSM, then the interconnects, then the fexes, then the chassis, then the blades, and the mezzanine adapters, that kind of stack diagram that started your adventures through all the different pieces. In detail, we started with the interconnects. You have two interconnects for redundancy, Active passive management, active active for data, and we talked about the first gen 6100s and the second gen 6200s. Then the fexes or fabric extenders in the back of the chassis, and we, again we talked about the first gen 2104 and the second gen 2208. Next was the chassis, the 5108 chassis. Four power supplies, eight fan modules, eight half width blades, four full width blades, and two fexes. It's very simple very easy to deploy chassis. 
Then we went through all the blade models. We started with the B200 half width and the B250 full width. Then we went kind of back to the B230, that Goldilocks blade, and on to the big B440. So all shapes, all sizes, all sorts of different options, not just for CPU, but memory and mezzanine I.O. connectivity. Then we actually talked about those mezzanine adapters. I started off by throwing you a whole list of things about hardware failover and all sorts of SKUs. But then we went and talked about the relevant adapters. And really what it comes down to is if you can use a VIC, either a Palo or a VIC 1280, that's what you want to use. But if you have to fall back to one of the others, you have some very good options there as well. So hopefully this gave you that kind of foundation for UCS. From here on out, it's going to be a lot more how we connect things, how we plug stuff in, configurations, things like that. So, you know, once you've got this, you'll really understand a lot of the other concepts as we start going through and doing a full deployment. So that's it for this lesson. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.